All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. My name is Ben Sullivan. I'm part of the Decriminalized Nature Arizona team here, and uh, very pleased to have you here for our second live event that we're doing as part of our Decriminalize Nature AZ program. Um, we have a little technical difficulties. What would a, a webcast be without some te technical difficulties? So we're hoping that uh, we will have our full panel of speakers here. Um, but to kick us off, I just want to take a few moments to uh, welcome a good friend of mine and a very respected member of our community here, Dr. Joe Toffer. Evening, Joe. Thank you. Good evening. I'm wearing my decriminalized T-shirt. Yes. That is. Support from far and wide. And um, we're hoping that Dr. Amalia Bach will be able to join us. Um, her computer is giving us some issues. So in the interest of keeping things going with our meeting today, we're going to get started and, and we're going to hope that uh, she'll be able to plug in shortly. So um, our event this evening is part of our education and advocacy team uh, of the Decriminalized Nature Arizona program. Um, myself and along with Stuart and Cable, who was in the chat, helping us along here, as well as Dr. Oren Cox. Um, our activities as part of this organization is to bring events like this out into the community where we can further dis the discussion around uh, the benefits and the healing capabilities of entheogenic plant medicines and fungi and, um, and entheogenic medicines in general. Part of the reason that we're doing this is uh, so that we can do our part to bring the type of change that we're seeing in other parts of the country, country to bring sustainable and lasting and reasonable change to uh, the legislation and policy that the country currently has around these types of medicines. So our interest here tonight is to uh, create a dialogue for you as part of the audience here along with myself and Dr. Toffer and hopefully Dr. Baca very shortly. Um, before we get into introductions and talk a bit about what the discussion will be here tonight, um, I do just want to, if you haven't used a Crowdcast chat before, you can see over on the right-hand side, you have the opportunity to chime in, ask questions, leave comments, uh, make your voice heard in this, in this hour and a half that we'll be together. So I encourage you to do so. Be a part of this. We want, uh, we want to hear what you have to say and what your thoughts are as we go through this discussion here tonight. Uh, Cable and Stuart are on the chat as well, and they can help answer some questions and and uh, make sure that we're getting a look at some of the questions you'd like to ask our guests here tonight. So with that, I'd like to you know just kind of begin the discussion and also just give Joe an opportunity to introduce himself. So um, I've been really fortunate to call Joe a friend for many years now, and I've also uh, been able to witness a lot of the incredible work that he's done to further the, uh, the idea of spirituality as a major component in healthcare. And so I don't want to take too much time. I'll let Joe introduce himself, but I do want to, want to thank you again, Joe, for being a part of this. And we'd just like to give you a moment to introduce yourself and share any thoughts or comments about what we're here for tonight. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Thank you very much for having me <clears throat> a part of this event. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna. Hopefully, Amalia will come on. I'm gonna say a few words about her too. Meanwhile, uh, first, I'm I'm Dr. Joe Tefer. I'm a family medicine doctor and also uh, an ayahuasquero trained in um, Chipibo shamanism or curanderismo down in Peru and working on uh, trying to help bring that kind of uh, medicine uh, and spiritual healing forward through uh, like, you know, the religious path is one of the pathways that we have to try to help um, legalize things, decriminalize nature, as we say, you know, the other path is, is the research path and the clinical path that we see with the psychedelic psychotherapy that I'm a part of a bit, I'm doing involved a little bit in that. And then there's the broader path, the decriminalized nature path, which is, uh, you know, something I support and I'm uh, happy to be here to, to talk about uh, whatever I can talk about in relationship to that. You know, I just, hopefully Amalia will come on. Amalia is my business partner at Ocotillo Center for Integrative Medicine in Phoenix, downtown Phoenix area. Amalia Baca is a naturopathic doctor. She is the main practitioner really at the clinic. I just help out there a little bit in support, but she's the main practitioner there and, and somebody that's part of this integrative movement and part of our, our spiritual community as well. Uh, 
as we try to kind of bridge everything. So we have members of our community and the and the and the audience, and uh, I'm just here to kind of answer questions and be part of the discussion. You know, for me, it's very important that uh, one thing just to open it up. We talked about this already with Ben. That uh, me, that's involved in. Well, first of all, you know, ayahuasca and the plant medicine that I've been involved with, sacred plant medicine in Peru. My family's from Colombia. It's legal there. It's completely legal. It's considered an ancestral kind of heritage of the land, and you know, there's there's legality popping up here and there um, in these different things. We we know about the the decriminalized movement in Denver, and then also uh, in Oakland, and now. The, this is popping up in Arizona. And so we had a group of people that were interested in, in trying to help organize these things led by Ray and Amanda Wyskowski. And so we're moving forward. So I'll just hand it over to you, Ben, to see what, what direction to go here. That's great. Thank you, Joe. And yeah, to kind of just pick up from what you were just speaking of there, um, you know, a lot of what we want to discuss here tonight is is going to lean a little bit on your experience and your perspective as a member of the healthcare industry, for lack of a better right. word. Right. And as such, you know, we want to be really cognizant and acknowledge the fact that, you know, while this this movement, the decriminalized nature of Arizona movement, the focus is on uh, entheogenic medicines in the healthcare industry. This isn't exactly the most, uh, you know, it's not something that we can talk about in great detail out of respect for, you know your position in, in as a doctor. And so we want to be really cognizant and aware that, you know, we're going to do our best to, to address some of these topics, but also just be real with kind of the state of the, of the union that we're in right now. Um, and so kind of broadly, you know, the, the title of this, this talk here tonight is psychedelics, integrative medicine and community health. And, you know, the integrative medicine and community health are kind of two sides of the coin when it comes to this larger picture of healthcare that we're wanting to explore here tonight. So, you know, kind of start the conversation a little bit around integrative medicine and what that means uh, and, and your experience in the healthcare field and as a doctor and as an ayahuasca. And uh, maybe, you know, kind of step back a few steps and take a look at it more broadly in terms of the role that spirituality and a spiritual practice can play in healthcare, and then also take a look at the larger community. So how does, uh, you know, how does a community offer the help to support uh, this, this larger idea of healthcare and, you know, your experience as a healthcare provider in some very different communities across your journey? And then at the end, you know, we'll kind of try to wrap this up with some uh, some thoughts that the audience here and all of us taking part of this can can kind of walk away from so that we can carry on this idea of like what truly is integrative medicine and how can we as members of this community bring that forward. So yeah. I guess just kind of start plain and simple, you know, Joe, can you help us understand what the term integrative medicine means? Yeah. So. Yeah, I guess I'm just gonna like just for a moment, just like to put this into perspective. You know, I hinted at like the the traditions that I'm coming into this idea of decriminalized nature through through sacred plant medicine use in South America, and also connected to had experiences in North America that were very important to me. And so, just the whole spirit first, you know, stuff that we're always bringing up. I mean, I am coming into it from a health perspective, but I want to put it there because uh, the spirit first perspective where me getting involved in this work uh, as a doctor and where I write a book about it, helping people with medical problems with this kind of stuff so that, you know, integrative medicine means basically holistic medicine. It means like all the medicines um, that, you know, like I say, there's only one medicine, the one that heals. So holistic medicine is the one that is going to acknowledge the, you know, not just the material side, but also like the emotional side, the mental side, the the spiritual side and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's holistic and it goes a lot more with the traditions of, of South America, North America, the native traditions where, you know, medicine people, a medicine man, a medicine woman is a spiritual, you know, path. That's a spiritual path. So we're just, I'm just starting with that, that these things are coming from our, our awareness of these medicines in the case of, let's say, people's exposure to peyote in North America 
or the exposure to mushrooms from the Mexican Mazatec, you know, down there and Maria Sabina and these spiritual healers from these traditions, that was our exposure, you know, to these sacred plant medicines and that also help feed a lot of the, the interest around, you know, the, some of the synthetic compounds like LSD, you know, coming out of Switzerland and all that kind of stuff. So integrative medicine. So then, you know, as the, this field of, so that's like the history and just putting integrative medicine where in the old tradition, as I always bring up, you know, health and spirituality are the same thing. And so the spiritual path, is a medicine path and that's a healing path and so that's how it was and it still is in many cultures and in many regards so then you know you have the the western medical path the allopathic medicine movement which is kind of focused and what a lot of people are aware of but then at university of arizona in arizona dr andrew weil who was there at the beginning you know at harvard with timothy leary and ram Dass and all those guys he uh ended up in Tucson and he started the Center for Integrative Medicine at Tucson which was a leading one of the first major programs in integrative medicine in the United States and really a world leader in integrative medicine which is really focused on holistic medicine so like how do you bring in these other traditions of healing into uh, modern healthcare and so last year at the, the U of A Center for Integrative Medicine mental health conference that was held in san francisco or bay area uh he announced that integrative medicine will be the home of psychedelic you know medicine so the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy that's growing on that track we talked about the spiritual track the research track and then the decrim kind of community track that track that's coming forward through medical research with psilocybin with mdma He's saying that where the people go, like, oh, where does that fit into the big system in psychiatry? He's saying that the home for that will be integrative medicine. And so, I don't know, that's my long story about integrative medicine as it relates to all these different parts of elements of what we're talking about tonight. That's great. And I, I really like that idea of how, you know, health and spirituality are the same thing, you know, and there's yeah. to be. Uh, you know, at least in my, I can speak from my own personal experience and a lot of what we see in many of the more uh, accepted methods of healthcare, more kind of across the board here in this, in the Western school, that, that idea seems to be not exactly uh, on, on the track yet. You know, there's places like University of Arizona and Dr. Andrew Weil, but more broadly speaking, would you say, or how would you kind of characterize where we're at as just kind of keep it here in this country like where is where is america now in terms of healthcare, in terms of what you just described well i mean there's there's a couple you know so we'll start with arizona because that's our that's our local focus and so arizona where we have you know some of the largest like native populations and that those traditions and those spiritual traditions like that exists, so that's that's still there. Whether that's you know people are paying enough attention to that or integrating or incorporating that, but those traditions are there. U of A Center for Integrative Medicine, and then you have, like, for example, among other places, the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. So the naturopaths who are also much more open-minded and broad. I mean, that is that that's what we call integrative medicine as a Western doctor. Is like okay, naturopathic, where they're prescribing medications, pharmacologic medications, and also you know, doing these natural supplements and, and, and different kinds of therapies that, that go on at the SCNM they have in Tempe, Arizona, they have, you can get acupuncture, you can get a whole number of, of different services from different traditions. So there's a lot going on in Arizona, you know, um, as far as like, if we were talking about psychedelic medicines, you know, and people's attitudes towards psychedelic medicines and psychedelic psychotherapy. So we have like a few, it started out like the first big study was a, the DMT study at the University of New Mexico in the Southwest as well, interestingly enough. And then you started seeing that was kind of, you know, in the early 90s and, you know, a little bit like, you know, small, but then the book came out, DMT Spirit Molecule and the Netflix. And so more people kind of heard about it from this part of the people who are into this kind of stuff. You know, a few other areas, U of A was doing psilocybin research on OCD, I think in the 90s, obsessive compulsive disorder. 
there and there were some studies popping up, like the early studies popping up in the early 2000s were uh, like end of life anxiety and the PTSD research that has kind of continued to grow and, and gain uh, progress. But then I think if you look at like the Michael Pollan book, this has been another big, how do you change your mind? Another big like flashpoint in the society of like, wow, hey everybody, what's going on? He talked about 2006 being a big year where number one, uh, Johns Hopkins, you know, which has always been a leading medical institution. So if you're a doctor or if you're in that kind of field, Johns Hopkins, you know about Johns Hopkins. It's a big name, very highly respected place. So they, they published their research on the mystical experience and the way the mystical experience uh, impacts people's health and how important it might be in helping to shift things like addiction and, and other problems. So they talked about that. The other thing that happened in 2006 was the UDV, the Unidad de Vegetal, the Brazilian church, uh, went to the Supreme Court and they got their religious exemption. Um, again, most doctors don't have no idea that that happened. And then in 2006 also, there was the LSD symposium, the 100th birthday of Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD in turn 100 in Switzerland. So all those events happen since that time in the last 14 years, there's been like more and more research popping up, more and more mainstream discussion. Um, so it's still just a sliver, you know, I think most people are not aware, but because of the impact of the MAP study, the MDMA assisted psychotherapy trial for PTSD, that it's so impactful, they're making so much progress with the people that are going through that trial, people who have struggled so long with the problem of PTSD, that they're getting attention from the Pentagon, you know, from the, the military veterans. And you see these movies like, uh, what's it called again? This big, great movie on, I should know, but uh, on PTSD with Iowa Shock to Awe, you know, yeah. Shock to Awe. And so the way those are the vets, you know, the vets are really like pushing it as they are frustrated with the care that they're receiving. And it was about, that whole movie is about them turning to marijuana to help kind of temper their symptoms and then exploring ayahuasca or MDMA psychotherapy. So MAPS's research is like, and the, the conservative element that's suffering in the society over being exposed to all these issues and problems, the PTSD that's you know kind of rampant among the soldiers, but also in the, in the police department and the firefighters. So they're getting the attention of those kind of people. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to like tap on the mainstream. I think it still has a long ways to go. I think there's a lot of doctors who are unaware of this kind of research that's going on. But there's definitely been a big like, you know, growth spurt of the number of places doing this research. So the number of, first is the number of medical schools that have an integrative medicine program. You know, when I went to medical school in 1999, probably U of A was the only one, Center for Integrated Medicine. Now, like you cannot really be a competitive medical school unless you have an integrative medicine track at your school, because the young people, they want to see that. And so then on top of that, then, you know, psychedelic psychotherapy, if it's as impactful as it seems like it's going to be, it'll become one of those things. Like if you're not able to bring that kind of care to people that need it. So it's, it's all growing, you know, and so it's based on exposure, but it's also based on demand and the kind of care that can be delivered. So I, I think it's growing a lot. Mm -hmm. And growing pretty fast by the sound of it. We're yeah. like in 10, 14 years since that you know, kind of watershed moment in 2006. And uh, you know, the conversation around it is, I mean, it's perhaps it's just because we're very involved in it and everyone who's on this call, I would be willing to bet, has already has a, a level of interest and experience. But even beyond that, it seems to be becoming more and more part of the mainstream discussion that uh, you know, plant medicine has its benefits and there's potential for there, whether it's through PTSD or depression and, um, so we've got a, a couple of good questions coming in that I'd like to throw over to you and hopefully buy Molly some more time. Yeah. Gotta get a Molly out here. Right. Uh, Carrie writes in and says, uh, can you speak to any potential issues that can arise from this work with psychedelic medicines being concentrated exclusively within the academic medical community and as a yeah. result, potentially excluding more of the shamanic spiritual practitioners? Yeah. I think that's a good question. And so there's that issue, right? That if you have, if you just had this track of the research track and the FDA approval track, 
then the, the psychedelics then fall under the healthcare industry and they have to be prescribed by, let's say, a psychiatrist. And so that's cool because you yeah, get this access for a lot of people, you know, that are maybe more comfortable accessing it that way. And so there's that whole realm of people that are going to get help and find access through that way. But like, for example, myself, that's on that is involved in ayahuasca and traditional Amazonian plant medicine that where it doesn't really lend itself very easily to research. So research is like the late rate limiting factor, right? We have to do double blind randomized controlled trials because they've just they've you know the drug companies and everybody have created this this one way track to get in to penetrate towards uh, becoming a basically a tolerated you know uh, form modality and so legal modality and so in the ayahuasca world that I'm a part of or that I have been a part of in Peru, et cetera, where it's coming from more of a spiritual healing tradition, you know, there's also, uh, it doesn't lend itself easily to this like little drug study, single molecule, placebo, cut all the variables, no messy stuff, no individualized stuff, even though they do, it is more individualized and with the therapy they do in the MAP study and the psychedelic psychotherapy studies, but for us, it's the what we're doing with people is so individualized and, and different duration of time and different ways of approaching people that it doesn't lend itself to research very easily. And so, and on top of it, the advanced practitioners in that field, well, they're not necessarily doctors, you know, people that went to medical school, et cetera, et cetera. They're very advanced trained individuals and in within the tradition. So it's a different school it's a different tradition. And so the shamanic schools have their own, you know, um, legitimacy, their own way, their own path towards becoming a healer and towards getting experience and towards harm reduction and doing it right and doing it well and doing it professionally. So that exists, you know, within that culture, which is basically a spiritual culture. So we have the model in the United States of with peyote, you know, where there was the natives, Native American culture, we know was getting hassled for their traditional use of peyote and then demonstrating that, no, they're using it for their religion, you know, for their spiritual practice and that they can figure it out on their own how to deal with it, how to take care of people going through that, even though, yes, they're ingesting a substance, even though, yes, this substance is psychedelic and, you know, very mind altering, but they can handle it through kind of traditional spiritual cultural approaches. So that's really important. And for me, that's, that I would much rather be part of that, a spiritually based tradition. At the same time, then you have the decriminalized thing, you know, I'm just saying these things, people shouldn't even go to jail for this, um, you know, for mushrooms or whatever it is. So just why even have the law involved? Like in other words, there's, that's not the only way to tell people, hey, be careful with this, is to put them in prison, you know, for using it. It's like you could say, be careful. There's so many other cultural ways to deal with things like alcohol, et cetera tobacco, you know, that we learn how to deal with. So for me, it is very, it is potentially limiting to just keep it in the academic world and track, but that's not what's happening. You know, I think people need to know that and they need to like kind of get it clear in their head. The academic track is what it is. You know, that might lead to a lot of things, including like insurance based coverage for psychedelic psychotherapy, which may be very important to help a lot of people. But then there's these people who have their spiritual reasons for doing what they're doing and, and the spiritual practice and the spiritual healing that comes out of that. And that's available. And so there's, uh, you know, the Native American church, for example, the Brazilian church, UDV, the Santo Daime with ayahuasca. There's other churches, our church, the Church of the Eagle and the Condors, exploring that option. And there's many other churches behind us. And there's churches looking at mushrooms and different things. There's that track. And then there's decrim, you know, which is just saying, let's just be reasonable and logical. And as we've been talking about, let's focus on responsible use. Let's focus on educating people about potential dangers. Let's focus on harm reduction. So I don't think the people behind my last point is the people behind the research, people like MAPS, people like Hefter Institute. They're not there. You know, MAPS's main message is medicalization is the path to legalization. So in other words, they're not doing it just to exclude it and just leave it there. Say, oh no, we're gonna do this and you know, never lead to legalization of these substances. They demonstrated that with marijuana, 
This is their like political polling. They're very a strategic organization. What brought legal marijuana to places like California and other places that are struggling to to get legalized marijuana was not that people were just not just the stoners. You know, we've seen that movement go forever. All the, you know, the marijuana smokers trying to legalize marijuana. What shifted things was medical marijuana. So when people realized that through the polling that people who voted to legalize marijuana and push it over the edge was because they knew someone that was benefiting from medical marijuana. And so MAPS has been arguing on that side and saying, by demonstrating the medical benefits, the therapeutic benefits of these psychedelics, you make the society much more comfortable with their presence and encourage the future legalization of these substances. So that's the funny thing, because everyone's worried about academia. I don't know the pharmaceutical companies are going to come in and take over and you know ruin everything. But meanwhile, like the push of the people who are actually doing that research work their mindset is towards legalization. Hmm. So kind of along the long lines, another question here. Thank you, Chris, for writing this one in. It kind of dovetails into what we're talking about. As these opportunities for research and, and study continue to grow, and then hopefully, ideally, those that research turns into practice and things that are being available to the public, uh, in your opinion, how important is it that the practitioner who is offering this psychedelic medicines in particular, how important is it that they themselves have the experience of the medicines? Yeah, I, I think, I think, you mean you're talking about like the, let's say the people at these clinics, psychedelic psychotherapy clinics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for sure they need to have the experience. And I think that all the people involved in that research also that I've met, they all agree with that. The problem, the difficulty for them has been getting the FDA to agree with that. Yeah. So in other words, for them to say, okay, as part of, I went through part of the MAPS training, you know? So the MAPS training is like for the, to be MDMA psychotherapist, there's the classes, there's the online part, there's the classes, they're sitting in, th in sessions with people and practicing. And then there's this like mystery track of like, okay, now you go through it yourself. And that mystery track is a mystery track because they can't really fit into the protocol until the FDA agrees, oh yeah, you, you need to do that too. So they do think that you need it, most of the researchers involved, and they're all pushing for that. So it's trying to get the government or you know the, the authorities to open their minds to agree with that. You know? And so that's a process that they're negotiating right now but i think that everyone that's actually involved in psychedelic psychotherapy i would say you know very high percentage is like yeah they've been through it they think it's really important to get to know the territory you know before you try to guide people through that territory at least to some degree sure and i think it's also good to point out that speaking of all this research and all this study uh your organization modern spirit is also doing its own part in terms of research and study. Do you, do you want to share a little bit about that? Sure, thank you. Yeah, um, Modern Spirit is uh, our, my nonprofit that I'm involved in. I'm a part of Modern Spirit. It has uh, some community you know, functions as well, and we've helped kind of do some community stuff primarily in Phoenix, and, and I'm thank, thankful to everybody that helped support all that. And then we also have a research wing and there it is, modernspirit.org, thank you. So Modern Spirit is a nonprofit dedicated to demonstrating the value of spiritual healing in modern healthcare. And so while well, we're trying to raise awareness to help shift the culture, which Decriminalize is also trying to do, shift the culture, right? That's the ultimate goal, what I was just talking about. MAPS research isn't just about legalizing and you know, capitalizing on MDMA stuff. They're trying to shift the culture. They're trying to shift the culture, and I think they're all very open about that. So we're trying to shift the culture. So research can help shift the culture. I see uh, Martha put up there, it's hard to argue with science. Like, uh, who's leading the groups in Jamaica? Yes, yeah, some people are doing stuff over there too, I think with Salvo Simon. So it's hard to argue with science. It's the, the society, I mean, science at least has some influence. You know, you've got the battle right now over COVID and science. So, you know, how much influence does science really have? But it does have some influence. And politically. And so by building the case scientifically, you help strengthen the case politically. And so our organization, Modern Spirit, is doing epi the epigenetics project. 
So taking it one step further into what some people consider abstract, but our thing is like, okay, these people going through MDMA psychotherapy with PTSD are having these transformative healing experiences, which is why a lot of people are interested in psychedelic medicines, sacred medicines, you know, psychedelic experiences is because they had transformative experiences with this kind of approach, right? That's kind of whether that was psychologically transformative or transformative to their own, their physical health, et cetera. That's what a lot of the excitement is about. I mean, how do we learn more about that and how, what can we do and how can that help us transform the culture, et cetera. And so these transformative healing experiences that people have around PTSD, where people had PTSD for almost 20 years, and now after a 12 week intervention, they don't have it at all, or 70% of them or nearly 70% of them don't have it. So what is that? You know, that's amazing. And there's something that happened there. There's a deep emotional healing that happened. And for me, there was a spiritual component to their experience. And I think most of the people who went through this uh, trial would agree that they had some kind of spiritual experience or some universal love experience, et cetera. How does that change their biology? How does that change their body? So we're studying that, the chemistry of that kind of transformation of the way trauma healing shifts. And so that's an epigenetic study. You know, it's a whole little you know whatever lecture on epigenetics you can learn about it on the website modernspirit.org we try to explain it more to people but we feel like if we can prove that and so we're doing that in arizona again you know just to plug in arizona tgen is a is a human genome project it's a genetics research um lab that's connected to asu and they're located in downtown phoenix and candace lewis is our main epigenetics researcher so we just received this week, tomorrow, we received all the samples that are available to us, which is not a huge number, okay, because of the COVID and not everyone was, no one thinks it's important, so they don't participate. But we managed to get some, probably enough to see something. So we've got the samples, saliva samples, and we're gonna start analyzing them. So we're still trying to raise money. It's very expensive to do this lab work, you know? Again, like how do you prove this stuff? Why don't people prove more things? Why don't people do more research? It's all funding, you know, who puts the money where? So we have our crowdfunding on modernspirit.org. If anybody out there, and these many people that are here, 106, you got some spare change despite the COVID, you have like COVID hit, you feel guilty, you have too much money, you can give it to us, modernspirit.org, solve your problems, don't yeah. feel guilty anymore, join the ranks of the struggling and, uh, you know, help us do this. Cause we feel like what we're trying to do is show, like I say, where spiritual healing touches the flesh and, you know, psychedelic medicine. I wonder if it's just lack of research holding back plant medicine. Yeah, of course. Of course, that's one of the factors that's holding back plant medicine is that is the research, but there is, and where do you do the research? Is it legal to do the research? You have to get a DA exemption to do the research. So ayahuasca research is happening in uh in brazil you know it's happening in brazil peru is not like you know they could do some um you know colombia is like kind of but brazil has been doing some ayahuasca research so they are publishing so it does have, it has more impact there because again you get where are they going to get the ayahuasca to come up here that's a whole issue so here the research focus with mdma with mushrooms and psilocybin is, is more impactful, but there isn't a lot of money going into researching those things. Mm. That's true. And it's like pulling teeth to get the money that we have so far for modern spirit to do what we're doing, you know, but I'm very grateful to the people uh, that have supported us. And most of them are people who had significant healing experiences with plant medicine. And that's what we see, you know, it's the impact that these things have on certain individuals inspires them to be part of this and i'm sure the decrim movement is largely inspired by that you know people's personal experiences yeah so and you see the link over on the right thank you cable you can uh donate uh following that link so and while we were talking bad news folks amalia will not be able to join us technical difficulties just she's not able to get on but she can see us and hear us so all 106 of us can wave and say hi molly and i would encourage everybody you know molly it's too bad that she's not here but you know you can come seek her out at ocotillo center for integrated medicine she's a resource in the community for for healing mess for immuno support 
you know, right now with the COVID, people are trying to figure out what to do. Well, you know, boostering, boostering, if that's a word, you know, your immune system is one of the things that can be helpful. And she's somebody there and is somebody that that is knowledgeable about this topic and is passionate about this topic. And so hopefully you can come see her sometime at the clinic. Mm -hmm. And this just means we get to have Amalia on in a future event, just Amalia. So we can all stay tuned for that. So based on some of the stuff that we were just talking about here, Joe, you mentioned a lot about the research and uh, in terms of bringing this perspective of holistic medicine and integrative medicine to kind of large scale. And I'm kind of curious if you'd be willing to share a little bit about you personally in your practice as a doctor. Like, how do you incorporate holistic medicine? How do you work with your patients, whether it's at Octio or, you know, one on one? What's that? How does it show up in your world? Yeah, well, I think it's like, you know, so what's the culture shift we're trying to promote? You know, what is the culture shift that we hope decriminalization would lead to? You know, what kind of culture is that? And so me, in my own experience, I would say that, you know, I was always interested in, in spirituality, you know, before going to medical school. And that was part of my struggle in medical school was that I felt like they were trying to, like, you know, close myself off from that part of me. Like that was somehow like part of it. And, and so... That's what made me suffer, you know, was to feel like I was closed off from my own heart and my own, you know, spirituality. Like those things didn't matter anymore. How, how you feel about stuff doesn't matter. How the patients feel about things doesn't matter. You know, it's all molecules and this and, you know, diagnosis and very cut and dry and cold. And so that is a. Uh, a tendency, you know, there's, there's, I bring it up and I don't, I'm not trying to trash like Western medicine. There's a, there's a lot of struggle to deal with, you know, there's a high volume of people to deal with. There's a lot of people suffering. There's a lot of death. There's a, you know, if you go work in the ICU in some heavy COVID area, you know, it's brutal. So if you don't callous yourself up a little bit when watching people die every single day, you know, you're going to have a hard time. And you see people already, you know, this to give people a little glimpse, you know, these guys like New York ER doctor commit suicide, you know, after being exposed to what they were exposed to from like heavy um, casualties, you know, around them, like PTSD from that. So the hospital is a place that, as I say, you know, many times nobody wants to be there. Do you know anyone that is like hoping they end up in the hospital? No one. And so if you're there, it's like things are bad. And so when you work there or you're trained there as a medical student and as a doctor, you know, you're exposed to a lot of very difficult things, a lot of traumatic things. And so you understand a little bit why people get kind of overly callous and maybe like hyper intellectual and overly rational about it. The problem is then you, you disconnect from your patients, you know, you start disconnecting from your patients. You don't. You don't listen uh, the same way that you would, you know, to a loved one or to a family person or like they say, like with your heart's eye, you know, trying to hear them and feel them as a human being. And the reason that's actually still useful is because if they feel good about opening up to you, you're going to find out what's wrong a lot faster. So it's actually more efficient. It's part of effective medicine is to have this bedside manner and to have this doctor patient relationship. And so for me, reconnecting to my own heart and feelings, which in my case was you know, uh, a major, was a peyote you know, ceremony experience at the peyote way in Arizona. Um, that was a major like reconnection to my own spirituality and my own like emotional health and well-being that reopened me up to feeling connected, you know, to feeling like I belonged in the world again. And so having that like connection to my heart to open my heart is affects the way that I deal with people, you know, in any kind of clinical setting. And then going through the experience, for example, of working in Peru with all those people for all that time and watching how this, these underlying traumas 
we're behind like a lot of medical issues, you know, that like not every single time, but let's say, you know, something as simple as a lot of back pain, mm -hmm. you know, that sometimes is like, oh, okay, you got a disc or you have this or you have this injury or you have that injury. But then to realize, wow, there's like a huge spiritual and emotional component to something like back pain and to something like, so that like, that that would and cross my mind when I see the patient. You know, when I see people with, that there might be some trauma or some emotional uh, discomfort underneath that. And before I wouldn't, you know, I maybe would have mind body kind of thinking, the issues are in the tissues, <laughs> uh, but it's like, I would think it, but I hadn't seen it play out because I never met the people that knew how to fix that. Mm. I never, you know, as a doctor, it's like, unless you really see somebody like address the problem, uh, it's like, okay, that's cool. You know, it's kind of woo woo, big deal. Who cares? You know, I'm not going to send anybody to that because I don't believe it. It doesn't work. But then when you see people actually like heal through these problems, then it becomes very interesting. And so something like, you know, another thing I bring up is like, you know, inflammatory, you know, irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease and all that kind of stuff that I saw consistently. It's not every single time you got to, you know, there's a lot of medical th concerns you should think about, whether that's uh, food allergies or, you know, microbiome and all those kind of thoughts, nutrition. But then it's like, hmm, like maybe it's a little emotional something or other. Did anybody ever ask them about the way their childhood went, you know? how that emotional development from childhood and childhood trauma might be affecting the way their body's working right now. And so like having a lot of experience with that kind of stuff in Peru really influences like the way I see people and the what, what crosses my mind about, you know, what might be influencing what's wrong with them. So, you know, that's, and that's what the book is. You know, my book is about that is trying to make the show those kind of cases to people say, look, Hey, if you see somebody who's got these problems, like maybe think about asking them about their childhood or ask them about their trauma history, you know, because it might be related to that. And maybe you could help them find somebody that can help them do that trauma work. It doesn't have to be psychedelic plant medicine, just some kind of spiritual healing. You know, maybe psychedelic plant medicine is the way for them. And so that's the decriminalize. You know, we're saying let it be available to these people. Some people can find it through meditation. Some people can find it through prayer. Some people can find it through, you know, ritual and ceremony of different kinds. But sometimes that's what makes the difference for people is like a sacred plant medicine. And so, you know, how can we make it more available to them? So for me, it's just, it's helped me shift my focus to staying more heart connected so that I can listen better, understand better, try to figure out what's wrong better. And um, for myself as well for them. And then also, um consider like the way those traumas and energies might be affecting all kinds of elements of their health whether that's mental health anxiety depression ptsd or like psychosomatic stuff like this irritable bowel syndrome or you know these you know headache problems you know sometimes or these chronic pain issues so that's some of my thoughts on that that's great and you know thank you cable again you know if you haven't already read joe's book it's available on amazon i think it's still number one in ayahuasca literature so that's well uh, i mean that's you know it's kind of a tricky it's a pound for pound pound for pound you know what i mean if you if you want to get i mean it's embarrassing to talk about it but if if someone were to and not that i'm saying that i do it regularly minutes to go. Just look average customer review under mm -hmm. ayahuasca books it comes up it comes up to near top or top i mean depends that's, on that can't argue with it that's what it is yeah that's so data. the the research the book and also recently we've seen that you're offering uh looks like these monthly zoom calls uh that look like you know integration conversations and yeah a little bit about that what's how is that being offered in terms of this larger well, there's a, i do i do like you know through okotio i god bless you martha for giving away my book uh read it Haley. read it um it's on audiobook too just in case you didn't know uh and in how many languages 
Oh, uh, yes, four languages now. Just for the record, we have English, Spanish. I really want it in Spanish. It's in Spanish. German and Melania Trump, our first lady. It is in Slovenian, just so you know. It's in Slovenian, interestingly enough. And uh, so I, right now, I'm, you know, I, we, I do do integration work. Like uh, I've been doing it through telemedicine with people through Ocotillo and, uh, and on my own privately as well. That's one thing, but then I'm starting to do these webinars. So my interest is like with the healthcare providers, um, doctors, therapists, ceremonial leaders, you know, I would put that in that category and other related, you know, whether it's massage therapy or all the different people that are providing healthcare. Um, we're doing small group discussions. First on the video that I put online, uh, which is uh, Spiritual Healing Love Science which is all about this bridge work between spiritual work and, and scientific work. And uh, then everyone's losing connection. Uh oh. Dun -dun. Oh no, sad face. Ning. What's happening? Whoa, that's bad. Stuart, save us. Yeah, save us. Technical support, please. <laughs> mm. Is everyone still, is the connection still bad? Amy Martone, can you tell us? You can keep going. We got the. <laughs> All right, we're coming back. Now we're coming back. You're our only. Right, I'm glad you saw us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So uh, I'm gonna. I'm designing a course, and we want to put out there in October a telemedicine course, and uh, it's gonna be based on the book. So it's gonna be for healthcare providers, and it's gonna be eight parts. And it's going to be explaining the book to people and updating the information of the book. So it'll be like these eight sections, one hour of like presentation and going over everything and updating everything. And then one hour of talking about it with people. And so that's about like, for me, it's about building community and sharing like that. We, we had the last two webinars that were last first one we did. A lot of people coming on, they're healthcare providers. Like you were just asking me that they haven't really maybe have the place to talk to people about the way plant medicine has influenced their life and their practice. So now we talked about ideas, but they also talk to each other a little bit, you know? So it's about building that community, which is a big part of what you're doing, Ben. And what this is too, you know, we're doing the decriminalized movement, but it's like also like, well, who knew that 108 people are gonna show up to the Arizona decriminalized movement? So it's, it's a community, it's a way to meet people and, and share. That's wonderful. And before community, that's an excellent segue to our next topic. Ooh. I do. We've got a good number of questions in the chat. So I just want to do a little rapid fire. I want to, uh, Auntie Belinda watching and writing in and she would like to know, Joe, will the epigenetic studies include the Native American population? Great question from Belinda. Uh, well, not yet. So you know, the tough part about this, I mean, I don't know if there's any, um, we have like 25 people pre and post. That's all we got so far, as far as I know. And then there's map part two, which we have been given access to. And that's going to start just to have, you know, the COVID stopped it. So if there is in those 25, and we know that there were not very many, or I don't know how many Native Americans that have been included in the first MAPS MDMA study, you know, I think the numbers were extremely low. You know, I'd have to guess they were in the, like the one to two range. So the chances of us capturing one of those in the 25 seems unlikely. So just for the record, that's not Modern Spirit's fault. We are just asking them, hey, can we, can you give us saliva samples based on the people that you're studying? And so we're just taking whatever we can get because why? Because it's a window that's being captured. So a lot of people, like people are trying to, you know, complain about what we're doing, or they had a different strategy, or they didn't want to do it. And they had all these little political discussions about the study. Meanwhile, the study is running, COVID happened, the study stopped. So anyone, we're the only ones that got saliva on the people going through this thing. So as far as there being any kind of biological knowledge about what happened during the study, that's all we have. So now in the future, if MAPS is trying to expand, right, we've heard talk about their outreach to the Native American uh, community and culture and realizing how important it is to, 
to know what's going on there about the potential for epigenetic changes and shifts around trauma for that community and other communities um, that haven't yet been included in the bulk of the research. So they're working on that. So in MAPS part two, there is that chance that we would see uh, more diversity in the sample. And then that'll depend on number one, if MAPS gives us access to those samples and if we raise enough money to analyze those samples. So we would like to see that happen. Again, we are just piggybacking on this, um, on their study. So that's the best we can do. And you know, why we were part of it, Belinda and I were part of going to MAPS and trying to encourage all this stuff. And, and there is a movement with MAPS to try to do that more. And I think the FDA actually has been part of that is the FDA is like, hey, you know, you're not gonna get approval until you start addressing some of these other communities. And so it's not just uh, the communities of color that are asking for this. They also, to be an established um, treatment modality that gets FDA approval, I think they have to show some degree of functionality with the different communities. Wonderful. Next comes from uh, Elliot. Thank you, Elliot. Your question is, what are your thoughts on microdosing, both in terms of the therapeutic potentials in the absence of a mystical experience, but also in terms of potential accessibility to practitioners and patients? Yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to throw it to Belinda. I can't like ignore her. Yeah, resilience. So I mean, resilience is. I'm just going to throw. I'm going to get to your next question, but just resilience. This idea of like your capacity to deal with you know adversity, your resilience. So we're you know we're going to learn something about as far as understanding how inflammatory markers and epigenetic markers and stress tolerance is that's all new information. So a lot of people want to know about resilience, um, like how well can we handle adversity? And so we'll learn something about that through the study, but it's still in development. So the question was, the new question is microdosing and what do I think about microdosing and you know, sub mystical experience dosing? So first, you know, it's worth saying there's, there's different degrees of like mystical experience stuff. So, you know, MAPS is using MDMA they, they, when they apply this mystical scale that they're using for the research in psilocybin, they don't hit the same levels, you know, as a uh, psilocybin, like as far as people's egos dissolving and losing, you know, disorienting time and space and oceanic, you know, boundlessness and, you know, feeling these kind of, I mean, there's anyways, they don't score as high. So that's one of their arguments is like, well, everyone's talking about mystical experience, but the map studies like we're not scoring that high in the mystical experience, but we're still getting big results. So that's just one thought right there that you get big results there. <laughs> everyone's trying to ask about ceremonies. We're not going to tell you guys about ceremonies on the decriminalize uh, Zoom video for the record. I'm not. And I think Ben already said he's not. And so it's just it's not the place, unfortunately, because what, here's a couple of things. One of the goals of this is being videoed. I think it's being recorded, right? Correct. So as we, you know, so just, just to address the community, I'm just going to take a little time out to address the community that we, um, this is part of decriminalized nature movement. One of the things that decriminalized nature movement, there, of course, there's people's belief systems on what we think everyone should do and there should just be like this and why isn't it like this? And then there's the strategy of actually dealing with the authorities. And part of this is recording this conversation and then potentially presenting it to the Tempe City Council members and saying, hey, here's, here's, here's the kind of education, here's the kind of information we're putting out in the community, and here are our attempts to not, not go out there and try to encourage people to use psychedelics, but to start informing the society and educating the culture about harm reduction and safe, responsible use and potential benefits for those people that want to explore it. So I'm just throwing that out there. Now, getting back to microdosing. Microdosing, I'm not an expert of microdosing, and so that's an area that a lot of people are interested. There's starting to be research with microdosing. People are starting to explore microdosing. What do I think about microdosing? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people that, that report a lot of benefit. You know, I was on a, I was on a panel with uh, Dennis McKenna uh, in Minnesota, and they were asking him, and Dennis McKenna's like, well, he's like the entire, the major benefit of psychedelics is macrodosing. Like 
you have to macrodose to really like experience what the potential of that can be. That being said, you know, a lot of people don't want to do that. And that may not be an option for a lot of people. Um, so then there's the microdosing that some people are more comfortable with and they kind of explore and they may have some benefit. So I think there's a lot of potential for microdosing and the potential benefit of microdosing that's out there. I don't know all that much about it. I haven't done a whole lot of it myself and uh, so I'm not an expert, but I think that it's gonna continue to grow in its influence and a lot of people are exploring that. And I think there will be research around that as well. Next question comes from uh, Matt. Thank you, Matt, for writing this in. And this has to do with the uh, the maps tr uh, protocols that are going on right now. What do you? What is your thoughts on the the two co therapist map model? Do you think it uh, supports the care or will restrict access to care? Yeah. So you know this is. They, the MAPS model, just to let people know, they're, they're, what they're studying is a 12-week intervention where they do psychotherapy with two therapists. And then on the day of the uh, session with MDMA, they also have the two therapists there for like eight, uh, six to eight hours. And they do that three times. And I think the therapy sessions are an hour and a half or something like that, 12 times. So one of the major things that's been brought up is that you know well the expense of that is is major you know to, to actually for people to actually pay for that is very difficult without insurance or some kind of financing who's going to pay for not just one therapist but two therapy you know imagine going you want to go to therapy but it's too expensive to go to therapy but now you're going to go to therapy with two therapists who both want to get paid their hourly wage you know whatever that is to uh which are men are they doing half the work i don't know maybe they, they maybe they don't deserve all the money but they want to charge that way. So a lot of people say, well, this is very cost, you know, exclusive and it's not realistic and it's not going to work out and they can't. But the, the deal is, is right now, the purpose of this is a study. And so they're doing it this way to um, make an impact. And I think it's extremely impactful uh, what they're doing with the two therapists. And I've had an experience personally with two therapists and going through the MDMA. And it was awesome to have a male and a female and two therapists. And a lot of people say that it's incredible to have that experience. So that's what they're researching. And that's what's making that once the FDA approval happens for MDMA to be a prescribable substance, there's gonna be a lot of room for a lot of different therapy protocols. You know, and it's not gonna be, you don't do the research protocol at that point. So one example is ketamine. Ketamine is the approved substance, right? So a lot of people are exploring the, the potential role of ketamine to do this psycholytic psychotherapy. They get somebody altered, and then as they're coming back or you know in the altered state, work on them psychotherapeutically. And they're saying that with ketamine, they can do a lot of big things, that it's like some people feel like they can do some of the same stuff that they're doing with some of these other medications or medicines. And because ketamine is already legal and prescribable, the protocols are wide open. You know, I went to a ketamine clinic, they're doing with some people are doing with one, they're doing it with two. These other people are trying to do a group, like have everyone on ketamine together and have somebody manage it, you know, kind of like a ceremony. And so, you know, there's just, it's wide open. So I think that when people are so worried about this, this protocol and oh no, it's this protocol and then that's not gonna work out and that's not cost effective. This is the protocol that is bringing the legalization, kind of opening the door that yes, it it's, can be pretty awesome if you can pull that off. If you can afford to do that or if there's some kind of community center where they're willing to help people that way, you know, I think it's pretty awesome. If that's not economically feasible, wherever and however this thing is gonna play out, people are gonna adjust, you know? People are gonna adjust and, and offer it in different ways. And so that, and that will be accessible once it's open. For as far as I know, they're gonna, I don't know, they're saying they're gonna try to control and people have to be trained this way. But I think as a doctor, you know, if it's ketamine, it's like, well, I'm gonna use it however I feel, you know, I already went through my testing. I'm like, I'm now uh, authorized to come up with ways to use it. So we call off-label use. So you use things that, uh, 
it's not exactly how the study was designed, but you explore it, you know? So you have hydroxychloroquine trying it out on COVID is the example that I think everyone can understand. It's not because they did research on it. It's because we said, well, it's available and a doctor decided to try it on somebody and now we're exploring it. Whether or not the studies come back, they could still try it. All right, you actually knocked out two questions in that one because someone else asked for your thoughts on ketamine. So well done, two for one. What is a cow uh, emoticon or what, is that an emoticon when it's an animal? What do you call it? Does that have a separate name? What does it mean from the heifer from Molly? Oh, it's another now it's a <laughs> Wow, just just no, no feces emoticons, please, please. This is serious. Uh, well, we have about a half an hour left and I want to uh, leave some time for some final thoughts as well. But I did want to just kind of shift the conversation a little bit towards this idea of the role that community plays right. in healthcare, right? And you've had some pretty unique experiences across the journey of being a part of some very diverse communities and actually seeing uh, the, the effect that a well-held and supported community can have on the, on the individual and vice versa. So I guess just to kind of set the stage a little bit, um, what is your thoughts on the, the role of community in the healthcare model? Yes. Hey, Maya. Yeah, I'm, I will be offering a class. It's coming up. I'll be announced through the website, drjotifer.com, and on Modern Spirit as well. So community. Community with this kind of medicine, sacred medicines, plant medicines, I think is extremely important, right? We've uh, A lot of people who have experience, they, they understand that. The traditional ceremony um, around that also understands that. So if you were, let's say, in the, like for me that I trained in the Shipibo tradition, you're doing ayahuasca ceremony in a traditional Shipibo village, you're doing it with your community, with your village. So integration didn't really come up as a major issue because you're going to see everybody that you do the ceremony with tomorrow, the next day, the next month for a long, long time. So you're going to be able to talk about it and it's going to be part of your communal life. And so then that's one thought about it. Uh, so then that, that kind of feeds into when people have these experiences, whether they're going uh, to other countries or they're finding another place to do these kind of ceremonies, they have big experiences and then they, they don't have anyone to talk to about it and they don't have anyone. And then they end up having to stuff it down and, and it doesn't have the same effect that way. You know, unless the, the healing needs to continue, the, the integration work needs to continue. It's not just, uh, you know, as I've said before, the way, uh, you know, Navajo medicine man, Daryl Slim put it, you know, the first, what we call in Western medicine, the, the way we approach um, psychedelic sessions, like in a psychedelic psychotherapy setting, is called set and setting, that we need to take care of the way we do it, like where we're doing it and how or what is our mindset as we go forward. Does Amali say I got video mean she's she's with us? No, no. just able to watch. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that's set and setting, how we approach it. And then Daryl says in the traditional way, that's love. So we approach it with love. And then we have the actual session itself, the trip, the journey, as we would call it, they would call uh, the gift of the medicine and then afterwards we call it integration and he calls it you know the responsibility of the gift so this integration piece that it's not as simple as just going to some kind of mountaintop in your experience and coming back and and then what so you know for instance in some traditional Navajo ceremony there's when you go through something it doesn't even have to involve psychedelic five minutes when you go through a spiritual ceremonial experience that afterwards they say oh they have to treat you like a holy person you know for for let's say five days for seven days afterwards that you need to be received and cared for as somebody that just needs to be taken care of you don't need to be cooking and cleaning and doing things people need to take care of you because you're carrying the spiritual energy and so it takes time for that to integrate and and become part of your being so the community has to do that the community has to be there to receive people coming back from these kind of experiences, you know, just to welcome them back. Oh my God, you made it. You know, we love you. We care about you. What happened? You know, tell us what happened. And, and when you need to talk about it again, 
let us know. And so that's the integration circles, you know, for instance, that Ben is putting on in Phoenix that are, are so helpful. And you see people getting so much from them, Some, you know, sometimes getting things from them that they didn't get from their psychedelic experience. And so just that the reality that there's so much more that can be gained. And when we don't have a place to take that stuff, as I said in the first kind of example area, things get stifled, things get lost, things get buried, things just kind of fade away. You know, you don't, you, you thought you did it. You, I, and I talk about in my book, the guy that is like, you know, healed, I'm healed, I'm not an addict anymore. And then he goes back to work in this old place that he used to work where everyone's on alcohol and drugs and it's really aggressive and it's really rough and no one really talks about anything spiritual and nobody wants to hear about his ayahuasca healing and all that, you know, BS. And they give him a hard time and eventually he's, then he gets pissed off. You know, he gets angry and then he's, he's fighting back with them. And then before you know it, he's drinking, hey, give me a beer, you know, and then that's, he's on drugs again. And so the community is what helps hold the space for us to be who we want to be when we don't have the strength to be that person. You know, that's the beauty of the community. The community, we tell the community, this is who I want to be. And when I'm not strong enough, please hold that space up for me. And so that's what we do for each other, you know, in ceremony. And that's what we do. And so that's what the integration circle is doing for people. It's like everyone's there saying, hey, you know, Hey, I'm wishing you all the best. That's what spiritual communities are supposed to do. You know, well, that could be somebody's church somewhere. They should be doing that for each other, holding them in love. You know, we want the best for you. And so that's a way of maintaining a spiritual connection and retaining that access to some of the things that they accessed, you know, through the sacred medicines, the plant medicines, help open them to this kind of divine access in some cases. But it's, you forget, you know, you have to like, it's not as simple as just seeing it one time. It's like, you know, uh, Ken Wilber, who is a meditator, you know, is very critical of the psychedelic kind of experiences. He says, hey, you know, that they can have a, a change in state, but not a change in stage. Hmm. You know, it takes more just, you can alter your state. You, know, you can get really altered. You know, you can get wasted on alcohol and be like comatose. That it's not necessarily going to change anything for you in your life just because you, you know, did some wild things. So on the other side, you might see some incredible, beautiful, mystical things, but it may not be enough for you to change your stage in life. It's going to take more than that. And everyone that's experienced is, uh, there you go, the, the Buddhist teaching is that Sangha is 90% of the path. You know, so it's just, it's the reality and the truth, and it's so important for the psychedelic community to mature to that, you know? Otherwise we will just be, hey, come on, let us do it. Hey, why don't you let us do it? But then they see the people spinning their wheels with these problems and not getting better and not healing. And the people are like, I don't think people should be doing that. What are they getting out of that? They're not getting anything out of that. So it's about progress, but it's the community that helps bring that progress, helps us to see ourselves. You know, sometimes it's not so easy for us to assess ourselves. I thought I was telling my friend, uh, cave on because I was doing as a doctor in medical school I was in uh, had to do we had to do hospice care you know so I'm going to visit this old guy he's like 90 something I say you know hey uh, sir you know how are you and he's like how am I he's like we can't assess ourselves he's like I have no idea how I'm doing you know I have no idea it's like we have to help each other with that sometimes you know, maybe maybe some people have a better idea, but the community we help each other. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned a few things like this right here. You know, this is an aspect of the community coming together and supporting one another. But I think, and I, I, I think you'd agree, like a major part of that community piece is like the intimacy of sharing that space with one another, right? And like being in that space to be. Vulner feel that's the safety to feel vulnerable enough to be embraced by the community. And, you know, one thing that this year has kind of shown us is how much we all, like as human beings, we desperately need that sense of felt intimacy and, you know, 
even just shaking somebody's hand or getting a hug. You know, this experience has really hard to hug from six feet away. You know, it's hard to really see that smile behind a face mask. And so how, how do you see the, our experience of this community or being in community changing with what we're all going through in this collective experience right now? Well, yeah, well, I think, I think it does help people appreciate things, you know, like, I don't know, uh, appreciate just being together with people and how important that is to them, you know, versus I, I was just hanging out with my friend and his, and his, um, his wife and their kids. And they were just talking about how, you know, the, their, the hustle and bustle of raising kids and, and especially where they are and what everyone's trying to accomplish. And you got to pack the lunch and do this and drive them here and all that stuff. And it's gone. They don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people don't like to be like, I guess with their kids all the time, or there's other factors, but just realizing that, that just like they, the, just the presence of each other is really what the kids needed, you know, like nothing, it's not really like, they're not missing out on but these. They, I mean, there's other things like school, all that, but they're, they're not missing out on much. Like as long as they had each other, like they thought they needed to do accomplish all these things. Like, Oh, I need to go here. I need to take them to this. I need to take them to that court practice, this thing, that thing, you know, running around hustle and bustle. And now that they can't do it, it's like, they're realizing, wow, it's just good to be together. You know, so there's a simplification, I think, mm. that is happening a little bit when we realize, like, it's just like, it's just good to be together, you know, just to share with each other and, and experience each other. And that that, like, kind of loving presence and acceptance, like what you were kind of getting at before, what this integration circles are, are about and what spiritual community should be about, I think, that we've been talking a lot about, Ben, is just that. You know, what I find that people were getting from like a properly run, you know, ayahuasca ceremony or something like that. And it doesn't have to be that. It can just be a, like a, a loving gathering. Is that a place where people are going to allow, well, first they're going to be safe. So you have to be safe. You have to be responsible. You can't be reckless. You can't be predatory. You know, that you're out. It doesn't count anymore. You didn't make the cut. Stop pretending. Stop making it sound like that's somehow relevant. It's not relevant. If it's not safe, we're we're not we haven't started yet. You know, now you're just hypocrisy and all that, you know. It's not going anywhere. You know, that's just somebody getting their whatever whatever, you know, problem needs that they've got going on, you know, playing out trauma on trauma. So, safe. So it has to be safe. And then once it's safe, for real safe, taking care of people with love and understanding, then it's like, it has to be judgment free. And so that's where the spirituality and sometimes the psychedelic, the sacred plant medicines help people transcend judgment. And then other people through their spiritual practice, they're able to get over their, their minds trigger reactions to things. And like we say, see with their heart's eye and be, you know, free from judgment so that people don't feel like, oh no, I can't say this. Oh no, I can't talk about this because no one's going to like me anymore. You know, they won't accept me anymore. So it has to be free from judgment where we have to look at our own selves and deal with what we don't accept about ourselves so we can understand and relate to that kind of humility and that kind of like shame. So once you have those two things where you've opened up and you've created it safe and you've opened up this spiritual access where people can now look at things from a broader perspective beyond just the mind's eye, bigger perspective from the heart's eye and with everything in between from all our spiritual capacity to see it from that perspective. Wow, like look at this lifespan, what's going on, you know? Then you have a place where people can, can let things go, you know? They can shed things, they can relax, they can and do that. And so, uh, alone, it's not so easy to do that sometimes, you know, we can't, people do, and people go that way, like a monastic kind of path, you know, just meditate and do things, go to a cave and get over everything. And that is some real, I mean, we've seen examples of that, but then, you know, a lot of times we need people's help. We could use that. It's a, one of the pathways 
we can help each other. We can love each other. And through loving each other, we learn how to love ourselves. And so I think that this loneliness or missing that or wanting to be around people and just appreciate what it is to be with people and to have that kind of support. Not better. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my inappropriate friends. Um, but I'm happy to be here. It's the COVID. I'm over here hanging out, and it's great. I'm hanging out with my old friend. And he's helping me accept myself, you know, because I've known him for 25 years. And I could talk to him. Being around him is helping me get comfortable with myself again. And so I think there's that, that community side and that love and that self-acceptance. We help each other do that. So hopefully we learn to appreciate that that's a lot of the reason we want to be together. It's not just to show off or to have this or be to outdo somebody or, you know, be at the right place or whatever it is, you know, all those kind of thoughts, but just to be together to support each other and to feel better about ourselves. Good answer. <laughs> um, and that actually kind of leads into, I think what the like sweat lodge, I have to say, like Amalia says, important points. Yes. Um, just, you know, we've only got a few minutes left and I think there's just like one, like natural question we've got left to ask and and it's also been brought up in the comments but you know to kind of let us leave this meeting with some things to do or or a direction to move in individually as a community what would you say are some of the action steps that individuals can take in their communities to move our society towards embracing this work in addition to supporting modern spirit yeah well modern spirit it's easy you can give us money through modernspirit.org and uh, tell people about it and share spread the word and realize that we're trying to do this kind of stuff the other way is like you know is trying to bring these the bigger message you know so it's like okay psychedelics and plant medicine sacred plant medicines like it's very powerful tools that can help us to grow and help us to love ourselves help us to love each other but you have to demonstrate that if you want people to buy into it. In other words, it's not enough to, you know, I see people that, so this is a side note, people that, you know, okay, so yeah, I drink ayahuasca and, you know, help people that way. And so, yeah, I've had some big wild experiences on ayahuasca and so people, like, they want to, oh, they want to, but I haven't had maybe that many. It's not always that intense. It's not always that wild or mystical. You know, I'm doing it to help people and I need to keep myself grounded and, you know, not worry about how magical or cosmic or whatever that I'm trying to get because I got to bring it back. I got to be able to go and come back, this shamanic thing, you know? Where go come back to where? Come back to some healthy place, some healthy community, some healthy where it's like, oh yeah, people are learning to take better care of themselves. They're looking to take they're looking to take better care of their families, better care of the children, you know, better care of the elders. That's what they should be learning, and that's what's gonna inspire the community. That they don't need to be high all the time to do that stuff. You know, they needed to learn something from what, what their, their, those experiences are, this gift, you know? And then there's the responsibility of the gift that we mentioned. And so I think it's really important for me in the psychedelic the kind of plant medicine, sacred plant medicine, community movement, decriminalized nature movement, that people also focus on that goal. That it's not a cult of like how high I can get the psychonautics and I did this and I did that and, um, you know, that's, that's not making an impact. I mean, it's, that's exploratory and I don't want to like discredit or disrespect people that are having these major explorations and all that kind of stuff, but you have to be able to bring it back for the rest of the community to like buy into it, you know? And so for me, there's a grounding and there's a sober element that's so important. And I would never be like doing what I'm doing unless I like had that. If I just like spin out with, you know, the tradition doesn't teach that. Like I'm supposed to ground myself. I'm supposed to be centered. I'm supposed to be 
you know, in right relationship as much, even though there's a lot of hypocrites, the goal, I'm supposed to be in right relationship with myself as much as I can, with uh, my loved ones and the people close to me, and with um, my community, my society, my ecosystem, and the universe. Like, that's what I should be aiming towards. And so sometimes people think I need more, more, more of this. I need more of that. I need to do more experiences to have that. And it's like, well, you need to demonstrate it more. You know, you need to live it more. And if that medicine can help you find that, then good. But unless you're able to demonstrate and live that, uh, it's, it's hard for people to respect. I'm going to read what Amalia says. It's important to know the culture and values within the community. Respecting those will allow better acceptance and accessibility. So the culture and values of the community, accepting and learning about the community in which we are. Dialogue within the community is important to figure out what are the social goals for that specific community. That includes the wisdom of the elders in all generations. So, you know, it's, uh, oh, nice. We have some Vietnamese knowledge, wisdom getting thrown down. We've got to put this out there. Quada Peg, part of my Vietnamese pronunciation. The spirit catches you and you fall down. The idea of going and coming back, that's it. You know, that's, that's the peace that we want to, to have alive. We're coming back, coming back to something, you know, to the community that's ready to catch these people, to take care of them so they can get back on their feet again. Well, that's great. And I think that kind of ends us on a really nice note. And so uh, with the few minutes that we have left here, you know, first and foremost, just want to thank you, Joe. Thank you for taking this time to share with us. And, you know, those of us who have the privilege to talk with you regularly, we get to enjoy these kind of conversations. So for the other, you know, 108 people who joined us here, I highly recommend, you know, you check out Joe's website, check out modernspirit.org, uh, check out the number one ranked ayahuasca book on Amazon per customer reviews. Uh, All right. Fellowship of the River and, and some of the other materials that are available. Uh, and also in regard to what we're doing here with the Decriminalized Nature Arizona, uh, this is an ongoing project that we are a part of and you are a part of as well. So, uh, you know, like us on Facebook, follow kind of the events that we're organizing. Um, if you have additional questions, apologies to those we couldn't get to, um, but you can, you know, reach out to Joe through the Modern Spirit website. You can reach out to myself and the other members of the, re of the education and advocacy team here. As long as they're not questions about ceremonies, we'll be happy to respond in any way. That we can. <laughs> um, the next month, we are going to have a, a similar discussion. Um, Dr. Oren Cox, who is a part of the education team here, will be having a conversation with Jennifer Montjoy of Tucson, who uh, is... And we'll have some more information about what that conversation is going to be about and how you can take part. Um, but for now, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking your time to join us here and be a part of this discussion. And we look forward to continuing this discussion offline. So we're wishing everyone a good night. Again, Joe, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Got to get Amali on here. She's got to put in her time now. Right. I got to, to, to Just squeeze this out. For an hour and a half, just Amalia. <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah, visit Amalia at Alcatillo. It's really okay. worth checking her out. I hope you guys get a chance. Okay. Dream well, everyone. Good night. Good night.